previously on Shade's review of the Bad Alpha and Omega movie. Get off me. No. Ugh, another window. We'll stop replacing them and I'll stop breaking them. Start calling ahead and I'll stop locking my doors. It wasn't locked. What do you want? What do you think? You review movies. A colorful, reoccurring character has broken in. I want to review a movie! Oh, sure. Spoil the magic. Can you do magic? I can't, but I think my cousin Jin can. I want to meet them! I want to meet them! I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to. Who put crack in your pancakes? Fine, I'll invite her. <sighs> I need to order more food. Pizza, please! <sighs> can she... Can she make dinosaurs appear? She... I... Dinos? I'm gonna meet your family, watch a movie, order food, and see dinosaurs! Oh, calm down, calm down. Okay, I was pretty surprised when you invited me to watch a movie. And even more so that you did it out of your own free will and didn't require me to force you somehow. Yeah, funny that. What? what is that? It is ugly. Oh, that? That's my new rug. Whoa, neat! They come with sound now? It's not a rug, Jin. It's my friend Soft. You turned your friend into a rug? Jesus, no, Jin. She broke in, passed out, and I put her on the table. Yeah. Sure. Shade, do you wanna... Uh, wanna talk about this? I mean, consent is an important- What? Ew, ew, no, Jin! She's got, like, something wrong with her, I don't know. I checked her heart, she's fine, I think. Regardless, she's out and I need someone to talk to. Wait, you were lonely, so you called me? Oh, that's so sweet! Shut up or die. Look, I need a movie. You said you wanted to pick this time, so... Did you bring something like I asked? Huh? Bring what? Uh, oh, yeah, I got it all here. The most awful thing I had in my house collection. <laughs> Shit, I forgot the movie. Shade is gonna kill me. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, give me that. Ma'am, please don't steal from Walmart. Oh, whatever. Roadside Romeo? Sounds like a lame porno. Where the hell did you get this? Ah, this is from my... secret stash. Jin, are you a furry? Excuse you? I'm a scaly for your information. And that was a little too much information. Start the damn movie. We open on the Disney logo. Designed, animated, and presented better than almost anything else here, tricking you into expecting high quality. Then fade to the actual opening, where a lavish yet barren mansion sits in the middle of the fucking ocean, apparently inhabited almost exclusively by dogs and sexually objectified women, who are also dogs. Before the first musical number even starts, as the camera shifts to our main character, we are greeted to the sight of him cracking open his arm by moving it in a way no living being should. The music, oh god, in almost every movie where the budget is smaller than a lunch for the whole team, the music is... Oh. Oh well, that's quite well produced and performed. It's somewhat basic according to actual native critics, but damn, it's listenable. Even exposits some information about Romeo. I'm impressed. Yeah, the song numbers are pretty bearable. If you close your fucking eyes. Dear God, this anatomy is hard to watch. Romeo himself looks like a pretty normal enough dog if you squint, but I can't really say the same about his horrific backup dancer girls. Yeah. Yeah, it looks almost like they motion captured real actors with really stiff joints. Give these poor actors some water. Ah, <clears throat> here is my area of expertise. The thing with motion capture is that, in general, the closer your character is to a real anatomical human, the better it tends to look. If you're translating human movements directly to animated dogs like these, obviously it's not gonna look 100% correct. That's why after the motion capture, animators usually go on to polish everything up, which clearly did not happen here. 
That could be because they straight up didn't have the money for it, as the $7 million that was this movie's entire budget, which is tiny, would have likely not let them afford anything further than this final product's current quality. Yeah, but this still feels awkward and uncanny. And it only gets worse as we immediately cut via bucket of water to our main character, sleeping in a concrete tube, the dog equivalent of penniless. He explains the situation more in depth, breaking the fourth wall by method of Ferris Bueller or Deadpool you pick, that his family left for London and he was kicked out. Just so you're aware, other than this and maybe like two other occasions, this motherfucker never breaks the fourth wall this long or directly again. It's literally just to exposit needless background information about the details of Romeo's past. I mean, the owners just getting rid of him wouldn't have been satisfactory? Fuck show don't tell, this is a philosophical question. Show or tell. Except instead of posing a deeper meaning and opening our minds a bit, it gives you a headache with symptoms of eye rolling. So as Romeo keeps info dumping the audience, he also does it by switching languages. Like, a lot. Why? Why does he do that? What I'm trying to say, my friends, is that wo meri zindagi thi. Kuch din pehle. Ha, kuch din pehle mere paas sab kuch tha. <sighs> anyway, such is life. Ek pal sab kuch hai, aur dusre pal kuch bhi nahi. Okay, so in other reviews, some Indian viewers commented that in India, it's apparently very common for people to switch between English and Hindi in their day-to-day -day lives. But the people who speak English the most there are known to be upper class and richer. So it would make sense that Romeo speaks the most English out of everyone in the movie, as it's used as a way to make him seem posh or part of the high society. But then we also realize it's not just Romeo, it's almost everyone. Also, both for the viewer's sake and for the sake of the lower class or those less familiarized with the language in India, it's more niche than something you'd expect from a movie Disney produced. And then to release it without a fully English dub? To be honest, it's too culturally dependent for me to pick apart, but I'm just saying, unless you're fluent in Spanish, if a guy in a movie over here kept switching languages every other sentence, it'd really mess with your head. A wee bit, don't you think? Well, again, hard to say really without living in India, but I'm still just baffled Disney was involved with this to begin with. Well, anyway, moving on. So Romeo is out here trying to adjust to life as a street dog, going from having everything to nothing overnight. As he tries to get a drink of water from a tap, he's threatened by three dogs and one cat who thinks she's a dog. Though they very clearly have weapons on them and aren't afraid to use them, Romeo is still too cool to take these goofy street criminals any more seriously than Robbie Rodden. You guys actually not killed anyone today, right? <laughs> so the dogs threaten him with legitimate harm, but then suddenly they become incompetent idiots more at home in a Looney Tunes episode. Because remember, kids, if a gang has inner fighting and visible turmoil, but threatens you, take nothing seriously. Also, this guy... He doesn't shut the fuck up. Quoting a particular Bollywood hit that I'm not familiar with admittedly, but it's specifically the lead actor he's quoting. This one guy from this one film, and I lost count of all the quotes he stole. Like imagine if, again, over here, or your equivalent for your country, if a character not only bases his entire personality around quoting a certain celebrity, but only one movie they were in. I mean, it gets kind of grating. And he slips these in just enough to get on my fucking nerves. In some attempt to win their favor, Romeo cuts their hair. Or adds a scarf and gloves and okay, you cut like two of their heads of hair and the rest of them you just gave colorful pieces of clothing. But this works and they all love Romeo now. And so they all go to get pizza with the money and human communication skills they don't have and they all pretty much submit to his will as their new leader. Romeo then decides they'll open a hair salon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring it. I don't think we have to mention the logical fallacies and why this would, in general, be the world's least lucrative dog business. Most of these dogs don't even have hair on their heads. And yeah, they only seem to cut the hair on their heads, not groom their whole body like in a pet shop because that would actually make sense. But somehow, their business takes over the town and they're making money like crazy, which they express in yet another great sounding but awful looking musical number. <laughs> Personally, 
I really like the aesthetic of this song though. We got these dogs who have nothing and they're earning their keep through honest work and having fun while doing it. But my god, these dogs are the most awkward dancers I've ever seen. It's... it's weird how they dance so stiffly yet so frequently change moves as if there was some kind of choreography. It's... well, the definition of uncanny. Something about this just twists my nuggets, I don't know what. Well, after this little number, they're all tucked in for the night and Romeo's enjoying the tunes from his radio, and you know, I'm digging their pad. It's small, but the little touches with the pipes and the wooden doors, junkyard furniture and stuff, makes for a fitting house given the setting. Kudos where it's due. This would have been a much more interesting movie if they focused on the world these characters live in. Look at the way the salon is built, the car mirrors, the tires and stuff, the way the dogs utilize objects that humans throw away is pretty cool. But no, instead of exploring the world, we get the hollow, cliché love story instead. Romeo hears a voice singing in the darkness, and instead of being smart and deeming it his hallucination and going back to sleep, he decides to follow it and get got by whatever scary siren is lurking nearby. We then find out it's not a siren at all, but something much more terrifying. A horrifically malformed white mammal, sadly performing a mating call to the oversized moon. Turns out it's a girl dog- Oh, Wow. She stoned the shit. Her eyes are so unsettling, she looks genuinely detached from reality. I don't know what cush she had, but it must have been the good one. I want some of that. Why is the moon so fucking huge? I feel like the moon is getting bigger. This is their last dance before the world ends. So Romeo finds his Juliet, named Layla because come on guys, we can't be that obvious. He sneaks up while she's pondering the universe, man, and one look into those glazed over eyes and he knows she'll think he's just a hallucination and dance with him. I mean, it's romantic and all, but they're both one step away from being euthanized a la pavement. <laughs> How often does she dance up there? Do people not care? She's dancing on their fucking roof! I take it back, they're one wrong step away from giving this entire complex a decent night's sleep. And she's so stoned that she'd pretty much let Romeo do anything. Oh, outside of kissing, of course. Hey, how about ending this dance with a kiss? No. Oh, dude, she just rejected you and she thought you weren't even real, brah. Yeah, not gonna lie, bro. It's one thing to get rejected. It's another that a girl rejects you thinking it's her own hallucination. So Layla tells Romeo some pretty logical stuff. I don't know I was dance so she displays pretty much the only moment she has any agency of herself before becoming a piece of meat for the other dogs to fight over and leaves. After this interaction and the realization that Layla is just a stranger and it's not that deep bro, Romeo comes to the most logical conclusion. Romeo's in love! I'm in love, love, love. Love, 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 love. I'm in love. Ah, ah, ah. Dude, love hurts. Yeah, dude, lust hurts. To be fair, I feel all these romance movies often fall into that trap. It's not always the case, but many characters in these films that seek to use the love at first sight trope only succeed because they're both written as compatible in a world that wants them together, albeit with some pushback for tension. Be it letters never delivered or a wrong text, whatever petty shit. It's annoying, we all know it is, but when a kid's movie, which tends to be more simplified and impressionable, tries to sell this, I always get, I don't know, a little slight bit irked. It's fine, it's whatever, it's just, it's annoying. So, business at the salon is going great. Somehow. I didn't know there were this many dogs with visible hair specifically on their heads. When we get probably the ugliest dog I have ever seen step into the salon, the other dogs are terrified of him. His name is Chano, and he's the right-hand man of the local mafia boss, Charlie Anna. Turns out Charlie protects the neighborhood with his gang, so he makes everybody pay protection money called Hafta. Romeo's friends apparently haven't paid their Hafta, so to appease Charlie, they decide to give Chano a free haircut. 
Romeo comes in, visibly distraught, remembering the two minutes and 40 seconds he spent with a stone girl last night, and... Dude, as far as you know, that's a regular customer? You don't insult your customers, that's how you destroy the business you worked so hard on building. Not just insulting, despite pleading with Romeo not to insult him and implying his mob ties, our good old lovebird socks this dude for not paying. So before you insult someone without knowing them, find out who they are and how they can endanger you and your friends' lives, punch the fucker! You are a man of only the best decisions, Romeo. Romeo even laughs off his friend's very legitimate concerns and explains even if they were going to pay anything to the dog mafia, they've already spent it all on this bitchin' crib. Huh? Huh? Bitchin'? Your booze mean nothing, I've seen what makes you cheer. This is pretty funny, because if Romeo used their money to remodel their house, it implies that there's architect dogs and construction dogs and home designer dogs in this universe. What else we got? Lawyer dogs? Barber dogs? Oh. How about stripper dogs? Or chiropractor dogs? Or wastewater treatment dogs? I mean, think of the possibilities. The movie sure didn't. Speaking of which, our emaciated and flea-ridden underling returns to his boss on a docked ship, where we meet the movie's main antagonist. Yes, it isn't Romeo's ego or something metaphorical or non-conventional, or even Layla. No, it's this fat-ass mafioso cat, Charlianna. Bitch disgusting! Charlie's pissed that he hasn't gotten his half to, but bro, they've been open for like a while now. Even made bank and had their home renovated. Where the fuck were you at? I mean, I guess it would help to hire more than like four or five goons for the entire city. Okay, okay, there are some in the background here, like two more, but they're just for the background. Or don't ever impose threats on anyone. It's like, who's enforcing your law? You sit on your fat ass all day. So Romeo's friends come in to beg Charlie for mercy, but he won't have it, not without his special task force. The Angels! Someone in that writing team put this shit on the script genuinely thinking it was funny. Let that sink in. That wasn't funny! Silk Sunita. Nylor Nalini. Polyester Padmini. How about Leather Lily? Denim Delilah? Or Fur Francesca? On second thought, they all have fur. Your names are stupid and your joke is lame. My disappointment is immeasurable. And my day is ruined. Also, polyester pad mini on the end is looking like a snack to Charlie ate the chocolate factory here. Charlie then hangs the four of them upside down. So Romeo, who's watching from the outside, decides to formulate a master plan to save them. Which is stealing bones from Charlie so that he can give them to Charlie. Apparently, Chenu is the only one guarding the bone treasury despite all the security outside. No wonder it took Charlie this damn long to find out about the most successful salon in dog history. Romeo succeeds in luring Chenu away by calling out to him pretending to be one of the angels. This shit isn't fooling anyone, but Chenu falls for it anyway. Which makes me think one of two things. Either he knows that voice isn't a woman, or he knows it's Romeo. Either way, this boy's pitching or catching for the other team, and his lust gets him trapped in a hole. Just not the one he wanted. So Romeo drops off their stolen hafta, and the music is confusingly very soft jazzy. Tomkar, hmm? You introduce. Main ka dost hua, uh, Romeo. Uh, Romeo? Like, what is this trying to convey? Romeo is supposed to be afraid and Charlie imposing. This music is oddly romantic. Well, anyway, he gets choked but manages to appease Charlie's ego by pretending he's some kind of fan, and this and the half of being fulfilled gets Charlie to release them all. Immediately after this, for no reason, Charlie decides the best method of threatening Romeo to comply with his half and the rules is to choke him. This time, Romeo looks less worried and more just slightly intrigued or maybe only a little worried. Well, after that interaction... I am a danger person. Chanu barges in, pissing off Charlie, who ignores his right-hand dog's pleas that the bones are stolen, in favor of beating the piss out of him and generally continuing to be an oblivious moron. On the way home, we're given terrible English promoting shady classes that are basically adult versions of free candy written in chalk with an arrow pointing to an alley, when these municipality trucks drive everyone to hide. 
dog catchers are introduced as quickly as they leave the scene. You know, what if we gave them at least a little longer? I mean, it'd certainly be cool to see them later a few times before the end where they show up one more time, build their importance and establish their ever-present nature as if one could lurk right around the corner at any moment. But oh well, fuck you audience, Romeo needs pussy. Uh, guys, sorry, but uh, I gotta go. Bye. Because Romeo is awful at getting the hint, he thinks no means yes and yes means take me, I'm yours. He goes to bother Layla again, but this time he's got flowers. Guaranteed success. Layla isn't very impressed by the flowers cause she's not like other girls, but then Romeo tells her I, I think I'm falling in love with you. <laughs> Layla is so stoned she can barely process what's happening around her, so all she can do is laugh in amusement at her own hallucinations. That can probably explain why she chooses to indulge Romeo and give him false promises of love. I dance Moonlight Night Club every week. If you love me the truth, then you will come to the stage and dance with me. If you are done, then you are done. But, but hello! So the next night, Romeo drags his friends with him to the strip, I mean nightclub, Layla performs at. He then loudly declares that Romeo is in love. Romeo? <laughs> <laughs> she? <laughs> well, that's pretty heteronormative of you. Uh, for your information, it's a dashing, strapping he. They arrive at the club, but we can't really start the show without a fat joke. Ta da! <laughs> Excuse me, please. Ta-da! <laughs> it's funny, cause she's fat. Laugh, damn it. I'm all for fat jokes, actually, but this movie has got the funny bone of a fucking slug, in that there isn't one. That wasn't funny! We see the club on the inside, and again, I can't believe they did us this dirty by not exploring the world building. Look at how cool this is. Imagine deep in the alleyways of a city, all the dogs in the neighborhood meet once a week at this abandoned factory that becomes a dog nightclub. Instead, we get Romeo being an asshole as usual. We then get exposition we could have gotten earlier as his friends explain to him that Charlie is obsessed with Layla and that's why no one dares go near her, and pursuing her is an awful idea. Just as they're discussing that, Charlie comes in and he's got a special spot where he watches Layla dance. He's there at every show of hers. We keep talking about how Romeo is a dick, but Charlie is somehow always outclassing him. The threat Charlie poses literally looms over Romeo now. But who cares about that? The furry dog girl show is about to start and that's all he needs to start thinking with his dog again. Layla performs for Anna and the crowd in an elaborate song and dance number. Again, it's well-produced, catchy music accompanied by questionable visuals that add another point toward the soundtrack. Yes, that's what an electric guitar sounds like. It's not even plugged in. Why didn't you just model an acoustic? Anna joins in on the song, or at least attempts to, showcasing his equally hard yet oddly decent singing voice as well as his thrusting power on the unconsenting air before him. Shortly into the show, right before Charlie can thrust himself through the railing of his high-rise, after several failed attempts of keeping his truck in his garage, Romeo leaps on stage mid-performance as promised. The 
the two sing and dance, and everyone is apparently so aware of Charlie's imposed adoration of Layla that they begin to freak their shit as quietly as they can. I mean, knocking shit over and yelling shouldn't interrupt the performance, guys. Come on, be respectful. It's pretty obvious Layla is high all the time to get through her awful life as a street dog, but seems she takes double during a show night because Romeo might look stupid, but she is gone. After conning the love-struck Romeo into leaping on stage and publicly displaying affection for her, including dancing and interacting physically with her right in front of Charlie, Layla watches, almost disinterested, with a half-hearted calling out of his name as he's dragged off to be murdered. Hmm, now why would I phrase it so specifically? Because Layla is a psychopathic killer, that's why! Think about it, if she knew, which likely given everyone else knows of Charlie and his love for her, she does, by telling Romeo to go dance with her in front of everybody, she pretty much sentenced him to death on purpose. Which would explain why she doesn't even attempt to go after him when he's captured by the dog mafia. She's probably the only one who could persuade Charlie to let him go, but nope, she just stands there half awake as usual. Oh no, Romeo, whatever shall I do? Romeo is taken all the way to the ship in ropes while screaming and struggling, which is supposed to be scary, but let's be real, some people pay for this kind of thing. I am liking! <laughs> I'm sure you are, Charlie. Deep down, so is Romeo. Charlie has them pull from different directions a bit, tightening the ropes and... Ah, stop, please! Oh yeah, he sounds so agonized. Like someone getting their balls stepped on. Come on, Romeo, you ain't fooling us. All jokes aside, Charlie is pretty distraught over the reality that Layla would sooner dance with Romeo or pretty much anyone over himself, and orders the angels to kink him to death, during which Romeo pleads anything to get himself out of this mess, including winning Layla over for Charlie. This idea actually intrigues Charlie, and he orders the angels to stop. After much deliberation and talking, Charlie allows Romeo to attempt to do as he claims he can and make Layla his girlfriend. He reminds Romeo that he will kill him if he fails, and he does this by of course you choke him again. Ropes, choking, sexy dominatrix ninjas, this movie feels like some pervert's weird furry lady in the tramp fanfiction modded for cinema. So next we have an... intermission? Do movies do those? In the 50s, I think. Here, anyway. Wait, does that mean I get to take a piss break for once? Yay! Cool, I want snacks. What's in your fridge? Don't worry, I remembered to stock stuff in case you popped in. Chocolate milk and ice cream. Oh, you do care. I will cook you and eat you. And don't fuck up my rug noodle brain. Meanie. Help yourself to the fridge, spoons are in the drawer, and don't wake the cat. Well, you don't look a gifted ice cream in the lid. You and Layla have something in common, actually. Oh, am I pretty like her? You're both higher than a plumber's ass crack. And I guess like Romeo, you both suppress homoerotic feelings. Soft, get up, we're watching Roadside Romeo. Soft, get up or I'm gonna stuff you in a bag and Aristocats you down the river. <sighs> can't believe Jin, Soft's groaning, so I guess she's alive. Let's just keep going. I really think those modern carpets shouldn't come with sound these days. It's distracting. You're a special kind of stupid, ain't ya? I am in fact aware it is a living organism, but what's stopping you from making it become a full carpet? The same thing that keeps me from doing that when it breaks my window and eats my food. I have no goddamn idea. But I'll miss it if it's gone, so for now it's staying. Alright, so we good? You ready to get back to this? I was thinking our furry quota wasn't quite filled up for today, so yeah, let's do it. So, after the intermission, if you haven't walked out already, we're treated to a bird shitting on the cat to really drive home why you should have left. Romeo is considering running away, the smart choice because there's no way Layla is gonna screw two-ton tuna can Charlie, but just then Layla drops by to give Romeo a bone for a haircut, and no, we aren't talking about money. <sighs> so nice. They proceed to have a sexy haircut montage to a romantic song. Let me say that again, a sexy haircut song. Let me emphasize, this is a kid's movie. Romeo says he loves Layla, but it's clear as day is just pure lust. They're not being very subtle about that fact either. Right. 
beautiful. She looks like an anti-vaxxer. I guess the Layla of his dreams is a middle-aged woman screaming at a manager. He thinks it's so hot the way she drives the kids to soccer practice. He literally comes when she posts minion memes on Facebook. Tell me, Romeo, do you like older women? But where are her ears? They were there before. Did, did Romeo cut them off? Well, while we're on the subject, I think it's time to address the murderous elephant in the room. Layla. The last time we saw Romeo, that motherfucker was being hauled off by Charlie's angels in bondage, screaming for her, likely for her aid, and she watched with weakly faked concern as this happened. Then, she drops by his place totally relaxed as if she knew he'd be fine. Romeo had to promise the impossible to even get out of this ship alive, so I'm calling bullshit on that, and she entices him with overtly sexual haircuts and not-safe-for-work pet lines about being his. Remember when Romeo's friends were freaking out about him going after Layla because Charlie would kill him? Which is exactly what ended up happening to an extent? Well, who was it that told him to dance with her in front of everyone again? If Layla knew about Charlie's obsession with her, which she must know, by telling Romeo to dance with her, she led him to his doom. She's the only one who could have convinced Charlie not to kill him instantly. She knows where his ship is. Everyone who pays their hafta does. My point is, she's a murderous black widow who enjoys luring men to their deaths for her own amusement. And hey, as fucking vile as that is, it's a goddamn personality. She enjoys it, doesn't she? Probably. And that's a clear interest. Gives depth, motive, meaning, all things that this empty shell with heart-shaped candies filling her out lacks. Romeo gets sympathy points for being duped. Suddenly this movie's better. But that's just a theory. No. No? No. And of course, what does she decide to do after Romeo narrowly avoids death for being near her in public before? Why, walk her home, of course. A pleasant stroll with a death toll. How necromantic. And Romeo takes her to such romantic places like a highway and another highway. Dull streetlights. That's hot, I suppose? Well, once they see all the sights, Romeo and Layla catch everyone's attention while they're playing some kind of game where they howl to compete and see who can wake the most people up. Well, I think we already know what this contest really measures. The size, girth, and desirability of their- Ding-dongs! Excuse me? You have ding-dongs! Why didn't you tell me? Right. Uh, moving on. Romeo isn't gonna draw attention to himself. He's embarrassed. Cause, you know, dancing and singing on stage without rehearsal in a crowded club is so much easier. But when Layla makes it about her and his howl grows three sizes, he manages to wake all the humans. <laughs> The sheer size and magnitude of his massive howl is so incredibly large he wakes all of them up. It's a howl that says, You know what, all of you better duck, because I'm about to turn left and I don't want to smack you with my howl. This entire game they're playing is one giant boys locker room joke. Romeo wins the game of course and he and Karen hug very weirdly. The song keeps saying it's so so right but this position is anything but. Romeo then takes her back home which is the club she works at? So this serves to highlight how little we know about Layla. Does she live at the same place she works at? Does she own the place? Are the dog girls her employees? We know nothing about her at all, not her backstory or why she ended up here, other than she's conventionally pretty and sings. Just when Romeo is about to leave, Layla decides to attack him with mixed signals. Like, for no reason. Good night. <laughs> She decides we're gonna kiss at this specific location at this specific time. Honestly, Romeo went through an arc from when he first met her. From forcing himself on her two minutes after he met her, to being content with just holding her hand the entire date and leaving without expecting anything else from her. Not gonna lie, he was quite the gentleman. And then Layla just low-key plays him for a fool with that move. Bitch. After all that, China walks in. Chanu? China! And he puts pressure on Romeo, who caves and claims he set up a date already, tomorrow night at the square. He buys this and goes to tell Charlie, so they disguise the cat as Layla as part of a plan. It takes a little bit of convincing, involving telling her this will learn her a place in the gang, but she lives with you. Helped try to mug Romeo, works at the salon. I mean, she's already part of your gang no matter what you claim, dude. What more is there to being in this stupid group? To get fucking hats? I survived joining this lame-ass gang t-shirts? 
Well, Charlie shows up dressed like a Reddit moderator, and after some formalities, the cat just straight up wrecks him and gives him a verbal lashing so rough it would make Fifty Shades of Grey look like softcore porn. Girlfriend? Ha! Abe gabe! Kabi chehra aine mein dekh lai? Mote! Khusak! Boor hai! Na baat karne ko aata hai na kuch bhi! Tum jaise kutte ki girlfriend ban ke aap unka vaat lag jai ga o vaat! Tumhe to ulta ladka ke maarna chahiye! Kaat kaat ke kauwo ko khilana chahiye tum ko! Ha! 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 It almost makes you feel bad for him, that's how awful her words are. But then you remember this guy likes one girl and is more than willing to murder anyone who breathes near her, making him the world's deadliest simp. So I guess he kinda deserves it, but still. Wow, kitty. Not bad. It's like watching someone get kicked in the balls, you just empathetically cover your own. Hey, wouldn't you know it, this pisses Charlie off and he decides to kill Romeo anyway. How? With... more bondage. What is this supposed to do? He's not trying to kill Romeo, he's trying to appease some repressed sexual fantasy. I know we've said it before, moving on. Romeo bullshits that Layla agreed to one more date, and he believes this. But he also knows he can't make her like him either, and he doesn't want to repeat rejection. So Romeo continues bullshitting into a song sequence about being... cute. And nothing says cool like late 90s rap videos. So through song we learn that Charlie has somewhat wholesome desires. Even if he is just a dangerous sympiopath, he wants to see Lila smile, he wants to have a child. Die. Oh, how this video is making me consider it. So the knockoff Bling Bling Boys finish their very mediocre song, and Romeo is at that same rooftop waiting for Layla to show up at their agreed spot. I don't know what his plan is gonna be from here on. She's been in the dark about Charlie's date this whole time. What's he gonna tell her? Hey, so like, I promise you to the local mob boss to avoid being brutally killed. Can you go on a date with him for me? But that doesn't matter, as the two of them finally meet under the romantic moonlight on what feels like a pretty awkward encounter. Hello, Romeo. Uh, uh, um, well, uh, uh, I mean, uh, wow, 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 you're looking gorgeous. They don't really have anything at all to talk about besides hello and you look nice, further proving their complete incompatibility. Well, Layla keeps her word, I'll give her that at least. Despite how weird it is to say, So we're gonna kiss at this specific place. Alright, we're here. So, uh, well, let's kiss. She does do exactly that. Of course, who would happen upon this but our old pal Chewy, who's off to tell Anna about Romeo's betrayal, but not before revealing Romeo's true intentions to Layla. <laughs> कि तुम मुझे उसकी गर्लफ्रेंड बनाओगे? I love Layla. मैं उससे झूठ नहीं बोल सकती. Yes or no? No. Uh, yes. But I can explain. Oh. Layla understandably isn't happy and storms off. So for some reason this means that all of the gang are incriminated and Charlie will want them all dead? He is unreasonable and stupid, so I guess I'll give them the benefit of thinking ahead, but I wouldn't think he'd really care about you guys. They all bump into Charlie, Channing Tatum, and the Angels, instigating a true chase scene, which is kicked off by Barack Obama popping out of a sewer while the group hops over his head. Then the three male dogs from the group, references Strong One and Scarf, are yanked by their necks until probably erect, which has them falling in love with the Angels, as shortly hinted at at the beginning of the movie. Because of course they do. Chili is taken out by way of a gag and an insignificant mouse character with his cartoonishly stupid trap, which is all drawn out longer than a line on a Nevada highway. Some bad luck leads Romeo straight to Charlie, where they can finally have out their building homoerotic tension with threats of a fistfight and some... interesting word choice. Oh, 
बार भी टच किया ना कम ऑन टच मी यू टच एंड सो फर्स्ट यू टच नो यू यू आई से यू टच मी ना एंड यू टच मी ना ये डॉन यू नाउ योर गे अपेरल इट्स क्रिसमस इन जुलाई or September whenever we get this out So Romeo tries running away but is actually a dumbass that can't look where the fuck he's going Charlie then chokes him again quite energetically You know man I'm sure you must use your physical strength as an intimidation tactic on everyone but you choke Romeo a lot like a lot what's up with that And each time Romeo seems to progressively hate it less But then the dog catchers arrive and Charlie seems to think the smartest thing to do is run right to them instead of hiding in a corner while they pass them by. Charlie manages to give them the slip until the writers think for joke funny and make him rip one out so the dog catchers notice him. <laughs> You are dog catchers. You catch the dogs. Why are you trying to shoo it away? No wonder you've never caught him. You're the worst dog catchers ever. Charlie is cornered. He's got nowhere to run. But just when they're about to capture him, Romeo comes to his rescue? Okay, what? This entire movie, Romeo was nothing but selfish, arrogant, and self-conceited to the point he lied his way out of trouble by throwing the girl he supposedly loves under the bus, all while continuing to lie to her about it guilt-free. Him saving Charlie was so out of nowhere, it nearly gives me whiplash on what his character even is. He has no reason to do this, unless he realizes, of course, that he was never in love with Layla, and decides to save his one true love in a last-minute act of compassion. They must be returned feelings, as out of respect for Romeo saving him, or possibly more, Charlie suddenly has a change of heart and has Romeo's friends distract the dog catchers while he tries to free his caged lover by picking the lock. He fails to do so in time, but after chasing down the truck again and managing to barely reach and free Romeo, it isn't enough to convince Romeo to want to stay. After all, what is life without that hot piece of ass that tried to get you killed? So the next morning, he's ready to catch a train out of there when Charlie and his friends show up to bring Layla to see him, and I. Guess she forgives him now. Layla chases after the train, at first seeming way too slow, but suddenly closer than I think she should have been, and grabs onto Romeo. Then the two fall off the train, have a laugh, and we get the big "I love you," delivered with all the conviction of two middle school drama students who just want to be done for the day. There's a big song and dance number ending, and everyone lives crappily ever after. Life may go in kami, they cannot, they can get. Out they go, they go see who I mean. Roadside Romeo, 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 Romeo. Main hu Romeo baby, darling, mujhe pehchana. Main hu Romeo, oh 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 oh, that's me. But wait, there's more. Remember how Pixar used to have those blooper reels in Toy Story and stuff? Turns out this movie has a blooper reel too, and we finally get confirmation that Romeo really did snip Layla's ears off during that sexy haircut. It's amazing how this ending credit sequence shows a side critics often ignore. There's people behind these, and one single decent-sized blunder in any department can ruin or at least irreparably damage any production. So we often take for granted what was done right, or where passion lied, and how many people were giving it their all and enjoying themselves during the creation. This kind of reminded us of that. There's not just animated bloopers. There's clips of the voice actors making mistakes and laughing while recording. It's quite wholesome. As for anyone who might be wondering why all the gay jokes about Charlie and Romeo and the Layla backstory stuff, well, to be frank, the movie was so goddamn bland at times, and the characters were so underdeveloped, we just casually took what we were given and tried to expand. <laughs> we came looking for and were promised a colorful storybook, and instead we got a blank coloring book, so we just filled in the empty space. Sure, we chose rainbow and black for most of it, respectively, but all we had were the outlines. Ultimately, though, that's the biggest problem that hits the hardest here. This could have been good, maybe even great, like a a Lady and Tramp meets Bollywood musical. It didn't even need to be a masterpiece. It had such potential, though. I had some hope and realistic expectations. I figured I'd have fun. I guess on that front, I kind of did, and I'll award the movie a pity check for that. But outside of necessity, I won't be rewatching it, nor do I recommend it.
What I will recommend is the soundtrack. That shit was mostly fire for me, and I might throw on Romeo's theme now and again while I edit. For sure, the most unique thing that sticks out is the Bollywood aspect. Without it, this movie would be as bland and forgettable as you can get. Let's talk about the character designs for a second. They do not look good. Romeo looks okay in some shots, but in others he looks straight up horrendous. All the anthro dogs in this movie fall into the good old uncanny valley. That could have been mostly due to the motion capture too, but these dog designs are bizarre. And I can tell you why. It's because they don't work in 3D. Sure, you can have regular dogs and anthro characters in 3D, but it's clear they made one feral model for each character and stood them up whenever they walked on two legs. They can't switch between two legs and four like that, it just doesn't work. However, I have a solution to that. This movie could have been made in traditional 2D. Why? You can get away with a lot more bizarre stuff if it's a flat drawing instead of a 3D model. And I'll prove it to you. I took the time to draw some concepts of Romeo in 2D. In 3D, he looks questionable. In 2D, he looks watchable. Since this is a Bollywood movie with dance numbers and stuff, this would be the best choice if they're gonna be switching between Anthro and Feral Dogs. In All Dogs Go to Heaven, this has already been done to an extent too. The characters switch between Feral and Anthro, but nobody has an issue with it. Because a flat drawing is a lot easier to get an audience to suspend their disbelief than this monstrosity. While I'm not familiar with Bollywood or the films typical of their culture and history, Based on reviews from locals and critics who are familiar, this isn't anything special musically or story-wise to them either. Why then would it be too much to ask for some divergence from the cliches and references that plague the movie? You can have them, the music, all of it can still be there, but why not give the characters some actual depth? Or like, what about if Romeo's either still or was a rich pup, so he thinks a bit more unfavorably of others and mainly poor and dirty dogs? But Layla was always on the street and views everyone, especially the rich, as possible threats or deceptive and cruel, so they're both too extreme and need balance. So let's princess and the frog this bitch and have them slowly see each other's sides of life and their stories. She teaches him to be more serious and down to earth and recognize that people suffer, and he helps her by being there and trusting her and showing, in an innocent sort of way and maybe an established quality that he's loyal to those who have helped him, that not all people are self-interested all the time and people can be helpful. I could go on, but that along with a few stylistic changes and, I don't know, maybe deepening the lore of the dog society, could have benefited this film in countless aspects. But as the saying goes, if ifs and buts were candies and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. I can't really recommend you watch this, but I commend and mourn what could have been and respect the soundtrack as well as the intriguing ideas I wish got explored instead of the forced and uninteresting love life of a fuckboy dog and his airheaded, possibly serial killer of a love interest. Um... Um, what? Well, the movie's over. Now I have to talk to you. Oh, okay. No, no, I, I'm just, I'm very, very bad at small talk. You want to play Mario Kart? Okay, but I'm really competitive and I tend to flip tables when I lose. <laughs> so long as it isn't the one Soft's on, I can deal, Noodle Face. No promises, Carry Edgelord. Knock, ask me who's there. My name's Romeo. Darling, recognize me now. Knock, 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 ask me who's there. My name's Romeo. The world admires me and bows. I've got all I wanted. I live my life carefree. But who you came to seek is ooh, ah, me. My name's Romeo. Loving, loving is my charm. My name is Romeo. I've got these girls in my arms. My name is Romeo. Darling, recognize me now. My name is Romeo. Oh, 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 oh. That's me. Romeo. 